Well, good evening, brothers and sisters in Christ. It's good to be back with you again another time to spend a little time in God's Word, spend a little time with you and the Lord tonight. You know, last night I really enjoyed the message that God laid on my heart, and tonight I want to really touch on an important topic because I believe it's something that we as the children of God and we as the church need to really take a good look at when it comes to self and others and God and our relationships tonight. You know, I'm thankful for the relationship that I have in Jesus Christ. I'm thankful that each day as I walk that I know that I don't walk this world alone. I know that he walks with me and he's there beside me, strengthening me and guiding me and encouraging me along the way. Because, you know, every one of us face things in our lives that we really don't know. And yes, Miss Cindy, we'll definitely pray for you. And I think about tonight about how that, you know, that we have these journeys and we have these times. And I, and I just want us to think about how that we need to think about our relationship with God. That's, that's very important, guys, because we know that the number one command is to love the Lord thy God with all thy mind, heart, soul, and strength. But we also have to think about our relationship with others as well. And, and because that's the second command is to love thy neighbor as thyself. And so tonight, and you know, I'm going to be over in the book of John chapter 8 at some point. But I want us to talk just for a little while if we can. I don't know. Again, I don't know what God's going to do with this or how it's going to go. But I, I know that this is something that is on my heart and mind tonight. And, and I just want to share. I, I want to talk about a moment of grace and mercy. Brother Campbell, we all, as children of God and, and as people and as creation, as mankind, <clears throat> we all have moments in our lives when we're looking to receive mercy, grace, and forgiveness. We're looking to receive that whenever we're going through something, whenever something happens in our lives, whenever there's a challenge, whenever we make a mistake, whenever we go through a situation or circumstance, we're looking for that mercy and that grace and that forgiveness. And, and, and I think about that tonight, how that we desire to receive that. And, and I don't know anyone that... At some point in your journey, whether you've asked God or asked someone else, asked the judge maybe, I don't know what's happened in your life, but somewhere's along your journey. Sister Brenda, we have asked someone to show us a little bit of mercy and grace, to show us uh, uh, forgiveness, to, to help us to, to look at our moment or our time uh, and situation of how we became vulnerable to something. And, and we're asking that person to understand that, that we really did not mean to say that or do that. We really did not mean to go down that road. And, and so tonight, we're always asking for that and looking for that. And, and I think most of the time, Brother, Brother Ronnie, we kind of really expect that from other people. But my question to you tonight is this. While we, Brother Workman, desire that and expect that and want that from others, Brother Philip, why is it so hard then for us to show that or give that to others when those people are looking to us to receive that forgiveness, that grace, and that mercy? See, in the day and hour that we live in, it's almost as if we're <clears throat> comparing our sins or our shortcomings or our mistakes with someone else, and we're trying to put it on different levels of justification to base whether, well, you know, I should be forgiven of that, Brother Ronnie, because it wasn't all that bad, it wasn't that big, but boy, what they did was just so tremendous and horrendous, there's no way they have to pay for that penalty. You know, I've shared it with you guys before, and I think it's important here tonight that I share this because it goes right along, Sister Crystal, with what I'm talking about as far as us wanting to receive mercy and grace and showing mercy and, and, and forgiveness and grace. <clears throat> I, I hear a lot of times, you know, when we're going through something, people making this statement, Brother Workman, oh, don't worry about it. They'll pay for it in the end. You know, why is it that we always want people to pay? You know, that's not God's will 
that you and I receive the punishment for our shortcomings. As a matter of fact, Brother Dale, the Word of God says it's not His will that any perish, but all come to repentance. So, so tonight, if it's God's will, God the Creator, if it's, if it's His desire and it's His will that all people, regardless of what they've done or where they've been or what they've been through, if it's His desire for them to come and find forgiveness and grace and mercy in the eyes of the Lord, then why is it us who sometimes try to stand in their way of receiving that from God? Why is it that the world, instead of them understanding that we found forgiveness and grace and mercy in God, why is it that the world cannot understand that, and why can they not show that as well? See, we think about many of us who have a past and how that, you know, even though that we have been far removed from that past, Brother Stewart, and even though we became children of God and we've walked in God and God's moved in our lives, it, it seems like for whatever reason that the world behind us still holds on to who we used to be instead of recognizing who we are, instead of letting go of those things and allowing us to receive that grace and that forgiveness. You know, <clears throat> and so I want them to think about that because if we cannot show grace and forgiveness and mercy to others around us, then my friends and I, why should we expect grace and forgiveness and mercy not only from others but from God himself? You know, because I think about that prayer when Jesus is praying the prayer and he's talking to them about how to pray unto the Father. So when he gets to that section of Scripture, it says, Help me to forgive those that trespass against me as you forgive me mine. You know, it reminds us that there is a, something that should be taking place in our life. <clears throat> we should, as a matter of fact, we should recognize the value of gra the grace and forgiveness and mercy that you and I have received from God for all the things that we have committed. And we should be so appreciative of that that we should be more understanding when someone needs us to show them a little grace and mercy during their journey as well. And and I bring that up because I want to be in John chapter 8. And I know that many of you have been here. You've read this. You've preached on it. You've heard it, Sister Tina. But here in John chapter 8, beginning at verse 1, we, we see a moment in time in which people wanted Jesus to give them permission to stone a woman called in the very act of adultery, which we know was br the breaking of the law. She definitely broke the law. She did come against the commandments. And, and the fulfilling of the commandment of Moses at that time was that she be put to death. But I want us to look at a glimpse where she see, finds a moment of grace and mercy and forgiveness from God through Jesus the Son. He says, But Jesus went to the Mount of Olives. Now early in the morning he came again into the temple, and all the people came to him and sat down. And, and, and what happened? And, and sat down, and he sat and down and taught them. Now, all of those people came, and he's teaching them, and so now they're learning because, you know, if you understand at that time that many of them, even though they had not received him as the Messiah, many of them did see him as a great prophet or a great teacher. So there were many of them who called him teacher, and so many of them came because if you remember at the age of 12 years old, Jesus is at the temple. He had got separated from his parents, and he's at the temple, and and he was speaking with such wisdom that it marveled the people at the temple that day. And so we know that there's many things that Jesus said and done that we don't have all of the information to because, you know, all the books could not contain everything that took place. But here he's teaching, and now they're learning from him. Now, of course, any time that, that something's happening, 
effectively in the kingdom of God, the enemy always wants to try to show himself or or to hinder that or stop that or do what we call throw a monkey wrench in it kind of thing. And so here Jesus is teaching these people at the temple and, and then now a new group of people come along. Not people who's really wanting to learn, but people, Brother Workman, who's wanting to catch him up in something so they could accuse him. And so they thought they had a perfect situation here that they could bring to him and catch him up in something that they could accuse him of. And so now it said, Then the scribes and Pharisees brought to him a woman caught in adultery. And when they had set her in the midst, they said to him, Teacher, this woman was caught in adultery in the very act thereof. So th this woman was caught actively at the moment. Well, I, I don't even want to get that uh, image and picture in my life, but she was caught in the act of adultery. And so now that, that he, they're asking him, they're bringing that him to Jesus, and they're, they're asking him, G teacher, what should we do now with this woman because she's been caught? And, and it's not an accusation. Somebody just, didn't just say it. She was actually caught in the very act of committing adultery. And, and so now, said, now Moses in the law commanded us that such should be stoned or put to death. But what do you say? This they said, testing him, that they might have something of which to accuse him. Now, here, they were not looking for an act of mercy or grace for this woman. As a matter of fact, they were hoping that whatever he chose to do would be contrary to the law so that they could use that in a way to accuse him and attack him and tear down who he was. But I like what he did here. Very wise. You know, sometimes when the enemy is attacking us, Brother Ronnie, when, the, when we are being tested, by the world or by the situations, sometimes we need to take a step back and take a moment with, without maybe answering or charging head on because we may do a lot of damage than, than, than good. And so I like what he did. He, he took time here. Said This they said testing him, but here's what he did. But Jesus stooped down and wrote on the ground with his finger as though he did not hear them. Now, I've heard a lot of people over the years speculate what Jesus was writing on the ground. My friend, I'm not even going to try to speculate. I'm not going to try to say that I believe that he was writing the commandments. And I, I'm not going to say that I believe that he was writing their names. I'm not going to say any of that stuff. But here's what I will say about this moment that these individuals are going to end up facing a moment in their life that they'd never faced before. They'd never experienced this before. They were going to get to experience a true moment of grace, mercy, and forgiveness. A true, genuine moment for someone who Sister Crystal did not deserve it. For someone who was, by law, should have been stoned and put to death. For someone who should have received a punishment that she did not receive. Don't that sound familiar to you tonight? When you came down to an altar, and even though the world and, and, and the devil was falsely accusing you before God, even though the world was pointing out all of your shortcomings in your sins, you still had a moment in which the voice of God was speaking into your life and you experienced a true moment of grace and forgiveness and mercy. A moment in which you were set free 
from that sin that held you bound. The moment in which the light of Christ shined into your life and you saw out of the mist of darkness something that was brand new, something that you desired, something that was truly amazing, an experience in the moment, that it, it's hard to put into words that sinner people, Brother Rocky, can understand because it's not until you experience a genuine moment with God where you generally find that grace and that mercy and forgiveness that you generally understand what people are talking about when they say it felt like the world, the weight of the world was just lifted off of me. And then it felt like the chains that held me bound were broken and I was set free. It felt so different, refreshing, and renewing that's the reason why brother Ronnie that we see big men grown men powerful men humble themselves on their knees and, and after they experience a moment like that the tears flow down their cheek and, and down their face and onto the ground because my friend they've never felt such a genuine love like they felt during that moment when that grace and mercy stepped in. I like that song when mercy walked in. You know, I think about that. Mercy walked in and pleaded my case. I, you know, I want you to think about that tonight. And here's what this woman, who I guarantee you, that the world saw no value in. As a matter of fact, Brother Ronnie, they did not want her forgiven. They wanted her punished. I wonder how many of us tonight have people that know us that would have rather saw us punished than forgiven. How many people, Sister Cindy, still try to dredge up our past or things from way back and throw it in our face and still try to beat us up and knock us down because they don't feel like that we deserve it. You know, I've heard a statement over the years that a lot of people really, I don't know if they know what they're saying or know why they're saying it or how they're saying it, but Brother Workman, I hear people say, well, I don't understand how this person here that I'm seeing praising the Lord and shouting and amen and glorifying God, how they could do that when I know just this past week they was out there and got in trouble. Well, my friend, let me tell you something. We don't know if they had a genuine experience with God. Hmm? We don't know if they had a genuine forgiveness. But see, what we what we want when we make those statements is we we don't want that person to find that forgiveness in God. We don't want that person to be blessed in God. As a matter of fact, we want that person to be punished. Guys, I'm going to tell you something. That's not what the Christian life should be about. You say, well, preacher, it, it, that, that we got to watch because they're going to get by with their sins. Honey, I got news for you. There ain't nobody getting by with sin. There's a God in heaven who knows all things. He sees all things, he knows all things, and he's got things written down, and one day they're going to stand and give an account for all the things that they did and did not do in this here world. And my friend, if they have sin in their life, believe me, on that day, they will be judged and receive the judgment of God. But why? Why? When all of us have had moments in our lives when we needed that grace and that forgiveness, when we needed somebody to look at us and show us a little bit of mercy, why would we want someone else to pay and be punished? But they not only wanted to accuse him, but they wanted her to pay. I'm so thankful that Sister Cindy, that, that God did not let people have probably what they wanted many years ago against me. I'm so thankful that in my ignorance and in my days of sinfulness, that, that I'm so thankful 
that when that person got mad at me and, and wanted me to die or wanted me to be punished, I'm so thankful that what I received was I found Jesus Christ. I received forgiveness of my sins. I received grace and mercy. I received strength. I received joy. I received everything but what they wanted for me. And guys, let me tell you something. As children of God, we should have the same desire that God has for everyone that God has created. We should desire for them to feel free from the brokenness, from the hurt, from the pain, from the darkness, from the sin, from the chain. We should desire to see them all set free. See, that's my desire tonight. As I desire to be effective as a preacher and teacher of God's holy word, not, Brother Ronnie, so that I might receive popularity, not that I might receive something big or great, but my friends, I pray that I can be effective in the kingdom of God so that someone can experience a forgiveness that they thought they would never deserve. A freedom from their past. And if you've never had anything in your past held against you, my friend, I thank God for you. I, I'm not mad at you. I'm not jealous of you. But let me tell you something. For those of us who my past every now and then still tries to hold us down, we understand what it feels like, Brother Workman, when we want people to truly understand that the blood of Jesus has been applied to our sins and applied to our lives and we have been forgiven and nothing of our past has been held against us anymore. God is not holding it against us and the world should not either. But how many knows tonight the world seems to want to hold on to things that they should not hold on to. Let me tell you, it's sad, Brother Rocky, when preachers preach about the blood of Jesus and the forgiveness of sin and how that we become a new creature in Christ Jesus but yet they can't understand how that we can be forgiven enough that our past is no longer held against us and now we are worthy to be used as the servants of God and the children of God. Brother Philip, it blows my mind. It cannot be two ways. We are either forgiven by the blood of Christ or we're not. Sister Brenda, we should be able, regardless of who we were or where we've been, we should be able to come to a Christ and have our sins to be cleansed from us and we should be able to stand with a pure heart and a clean mind and a clean life before God Almighty justified through the blood of Christ. But ain't it amazing how that people want people to pay. Said, and he stooped down and he began to write on the ground with his finger as though he did not hear them. So when they continued asking him, he raised himself up and said to them, He who is without sin among you, let him throw a stone at her first. He says, if any of you can tell me right now that you have no sin in your life, that you are perfect right now, he said, go ahead and stone her. Boy, what an answer. Brother Workman, that he should give. I think about that scripture says, how is it that you try to remove the speck in your brother's eye when you have a beam in your own? How is it that you're trying to fix other people's sins or other people's life when you got stuff in your life, he says. But yet it seems like they had no problem casting that stone and not recognizing that we all need Jesus in our lives. We need that grace, that mercy, and that forgiveness. We need a God that loves us daily. Now, I'm not saying... That it's okay for us to go out and live any way we want to. Because we're going to find this that out as well here too in this. Jesus says, 
Those of you who have no sin, go ahead. Cast that stone. Said it again. He stooped down and wrote on the ground Then those who heard it. Being convicted by their conscience, went out one by one, beginning with the oldest, even to the last. And Jesus was left alone, and the woman standing in the midst, when Jesus had raised up himself, himself up again, and saw no one but the woman, he said to her, Woman, where are those accusers of yours? Has no one condemned you? She said, No, not one, Lord. And Jesus said to her, Neither do I condemn you. Now, Jesus has shown grace and mercy and forgiveness. But Brother Philip, he also tells her, he said, I'm not going to condemn you, young lady. He said, I'm going to forgive that. He said, but do this. Go and sin no more. Do not use this moment of mercy and grace and forgiveness as a will or a plan to continue to sin. See, Brother John, there needs to be a conviction, a change that takes place when we come down and we ask God to forgive us of our sins, and we experience that moment of forgiveness and grace and mercy, there should be a change that takes place in our lives too. Sister Brenda, no longer should we desire to go out and live like we did before we came and found forgiveness. No longer should we desire to continue in the sins in which we receive forgiveness from. There should be a change. But too many times, people have taken this in the opposite direction. And they went out and lived any way they wanted to and said, I don't have to worry because I've got the grace and the mercy of God on my life. I got news for you, my friend. You still have to live in a way that is pleasing unto God. Jesus talks about being perfect even as he is perfect or being holy even as he is holy. My friend, let me tell you something. To live a holy life, peculiar, separating ourselves from the world and from sin, shunning the very appearance of evil, my friend, means that when we come down and we find that forgiveness, we don't go back and repeat it. As I'm going to tell you, if, if that happened in the court of law, Sister Crystal, if a person went out and committed a, 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 a broke the law and committed a crime and they came to the court and the judge was lenient and showed them forgiveness and mercy and they came back over and over again, at some point the judge would see that they were not sincere in asking for their forgiveness. They were not sincere in their heart about the wrong that they had done. And what they would find, Brother Ronnie, is that judge would then cast judgment upon them. And they, instead of them finding the grace and forgiveness and mercy, they would find the justice of that judge that day. My friend, you should not play with the grace and the mercy of God as if it's some toy or some game. You need to take the grace and the forgiveness and mercy of God very serious, my friend. When God forgives you, you should desire and hunger for a change to take place in your life. But when it does take place, you should not easily forget where you came from and what God has forgiven you for, what God has done for you. You should not forget that because then you should not turn around and demand justice on others instead of grace and mercy too. See, my friend, I think about that scripture when he says, 
That if we see that brother and sister overtaken in the fall. Yes, I know I quote this scripture a lot, but I can't help it. It fits in right here. He said, when we see him overtaken in the fall, he said, you which are spiritual, restore such a one back to the faith. But he also goes on, he said, but consider yourselves. At least you also be tempted with the same temptation thereof. My friends, let me tell you something. When you look at someone else and say, I would never do that, man, you are walking on some dangerous ground because I'm going to tell you something. You don't know what you would do, the choice that you would make if you was that person in their situation, dealing with their environment and going through their going through all the problems and the trials they're going through. You don't know if you would make the same choice or not. But what you should know is that when you see them making the choices that they should not, what you should know is that is a soul that is precious unto God Almighty. That is a soul that you should care about and desire to be saved and set free. That is a soul that belongs to someone that's going to spend either eternity in heaven or eternity in hell. That's someone's child. That's someone's baby. That's someone's wife, someone's husband, someone's dad, someone's mother, someone's brother, someone's sister. That's somebody, someone, somewhere, and that person cares about their condition but most of all they are God's creation and God created them when he formed them in her mother's womb and God cares about them and desires to see them change too see how do we get from that point of wanting that for ourselves but not wanting that for others. Well, how do we get to the point where we want it for both? He goes on. And he said, Then Jesus spoke to them again, saying, I am the light of the world. He who follows me shall not walk in darkness, but, sh but have the light of life. The Pharisees therefore said to him, You bear witness of yourself. Your witness is not true. Jesus answered and said to them, Even if I bear witness of myself, my witness is true. For I know where I came from and where I'm going. But you do not know where I come from and where I'm going. You judge according to the flesh. I judge no one. Yet, if I do judge... Now, here's where people get in trouble, Brother Workman. They said that, you know, there should be no type of judgment, but there is a righteous judgment that happens on people's lives. And my friend, that righteous judgment should come through the Word of God. But where they got in trouble, where the Pharisees got in trouble, is they were not given a righteous judgment, but they were judging according to their flesh. He said, my judgment is true, for I am not alone, but I am with the Father who sent me. It is also written in your law that the testimony of two men is true. I am one who bears witness of myself, and the Father who sent me bears witness of me. Then they said to him, where is your father? Jesus answered, You know neither me nor my father. If you had known me, you would have known my father also. Those words Jesus spoke in the treasury as he taught in the temple, and no one laid hands on him, for his hour had not yet come. See, here we know that there is a moment in time leading up to Jesus' death. We know that and, his, and and being judged and dying on the cross, but his time is not yet. But here's the thing, my friends. I think, and I'm going to have to slow down right here, I do believe. I think that there's times in our lives that if we are not careful, that we can feel as if we deserve all the blessings and forgiveness and the grace and the mercy of God that God has to give. But for whatever reason, sometimes it's hard for people to see that for all mankind. Or preacher, there's people out there that I don't think deserves anything. 
My friend, to be honest with you, the Word of God says that, that we were all sinners at one time and, and that our sin stunk in the nostrils of God. Uh, none of us deserved it. None of us. But aren't you glad that we received something that we did not deserve? We received something that we did not earn. It was not by works. According to the book of Ephesians, it was a gift from God. A gift that was given to you even though you didn't earn it. My friends, let me tell you something. In your flesh, in your own power, in your own might, in your own will, you cannot earn what God wants to give you tonight. But my friend, if you open your hearts and let him in and let him change your life, you can receive that grace and that mercy and forgiveness of God tonight. Maybe you've not really had a genuine moment and when you experience that genuine forgiveness of God. My friends, let this be the night. Let this be the hour. Let this be the moment that you experience God that way. Let yourself experience a true moment of grace and mercy and forgiveness tonight. Let us pray. Father God, as we come to you, we are truly thankful and grateful, Father God, for all that you do for us, Father God. I know that tonight that we don't deserve by our own power and might all that you give unto us, but we are thankful that we are able to receive because of the justification that we have received through the shed blood of Jesus Christ. I'm thankful, Father God, that even though the world may still see my past, even though the world may still remember my failures and my shortcomings. I am thankful, Father God, that you tonight do not, that you have forgiven that. And that it, while it's under the blood of Christ, that it's been forgiven and never will be up, brought up to be remembered again. I'm thankful, Father God, that I get to experience a love so genuine and true. But Lord, tonight I just pray that everyone listening in that hears this message, that Father God, that they not only have they experienced, but they continue to experience in their daily walk of your love and your grace and mercy and power, Father God. Father God, if there's one tonight that don't know you as Lord and Savior, I pray that right now that this would be the moment that their lives would be changed forever and that they too get to experience this life-changing forgiveness and freedom that I'm speaking about tonight. Father God, speak your word that it may be so. Speak it according to your will, Father God. In Jesus' mighty name we pray and amen. Thank you for being with me tonight. Thank you for praying with me, praying for me, and praying for others. My friends, let's share tonight's message. Let just guess, Brother Ronnie, we're going to pray for you for Sunday. Be lifting up Brother Ronnie. I asked the church to pray for you when, on Wednesday night Bible study. We're definitely going to be praying for you and, and for, for you, Sister Cindy, that is sick, and any others that need prayer too. My friends, make sure you share tonight's message. Don't forget, we'll be back on Sunday morning at 1030 at Gordon Road Church of God preaching a message this Sunday. Uh, God has laid on my heart to preach a message on God's unstoppable plan. I hope that you'll come and be with us in person. If not, I pray that you'll tune in online and listen to the message that God has laid on our heart for Gordon Road Church of God. Wherever you go, my friends, I pray that God goes with you. Whatever you do, I pray that God blesses you, strengthens you, and guides you. But most of all tonight, my friends, I'm praying that God will use each and every one of you to reach someone else for the gospel truth. Be blessed and have a wonderful night.